Welcome to the CES letter, A Closer Look. This video presentation is working from the March 31st, 2015 edition of the CES letter. It will examine pages 31 through 34 that discuss polyandry concerns and questions. This issue seems to have been rather bothersome to the author of the CES letter because he refers to it again six additional times. Webster's 1830 Dictionary defines polyandry as the practice of females having more husbands than one at the same time, plurality of husbands. In contrast, it defines polygyny as the practice of having more wives than one at the same time. Traditional polygamy, or a plurality of wives, is really polygyny. The word polygamy actually means a plurality of wives or husbands at the same time. We will use the literal terms of polyandry and polygyny in this video. The primary evidence presented in the CES letter to support the claim that Joseph Smith practiced polyandry is primarily appearances and assumptions. Because the women were legally married at the time of their sealing to Joseph Smith, it appears that the woman had two husbands. But, in actuality, did the sealing ceremony create a second husband? Some viewers may not be aware that two types of sealings were performed between Joseph Smith and these women. Eternity only, applying after death, and time and eternity that supersede the legal marriage covenants. In other words, a woman sealed to Joseph Smith in an eternity-only ceremony would not be his wife on earth, and a time and eternity sealing ceremony would cause the legal ceremony to be done away, because DNC 22 verse 1 explains all old covenants are done away in this, the new and everlasting covenant. In either case, the woman would have only one husband after the ceremonies. It appears that all of Joseph Smith's 14 sealings to legally married women fall into one of these two categories. But the author of the CES letter does not investigate any of them. Perhaps the strongest supportive evidence for polyandry is that it is impossible to prove something did not happen. The lack of evidence is not evidence of lack. So while we will examine the evidence in this video, there is no way to prove polyandry did not occur. Polyandry would have been foreign to the women involved who were devout Christians and who would have had no context for the practice or how it might have been morally acceptable. No biblical examples were available like in the case of a plurality of wives. An 1891 article in the Popular Science Monthly on polyandry declared, it is inconceivable that men should have voluntarily initiated polyandry, even if, by doing violence to our common sense, we suppose such a thing to be possible on the part of the men, how would the women submit? This was not directed towards Joseph Smith, nor was he mentioned in the article, but the quandary would have been the same. Joseph might have dictated a revelation authorizing polyandry, but he didn't. Instead, he dictated a revelation condemning polyandry that states, If any man espouse a virgin, and if one, after she is espoused, shall be with another man, she has committed adultery and shall be destroyed. So we are left wondering what Joseph might have said to convince a woman to go against social and moral conventions. On page 31, the CES letter speaks of threats that Joseph was going to be slain by an angel with a drawn sword if the girls didn't marry him. Joseph never made such a threat. This is simply false. What about the husbands? Little is known about most of the men's awareness of the ceilings when they occurred, except none of them left a complaint against Joseph Smith. It appears that Albert Smith did not know about the sealing. Joseph C. Kingsbury was supportive of both ceremonies. He wrote, On the 16th day of October, Caroline, my wife, died. 
How thankful I feel, thinking I shall see and meet her again, to enjoy each other society forever, to part no more, and also my little sons. And on the 29th of April, 1843, I, according to President Joseph Smith's counsel and others, agreed to stand by Sarah Ann Whitney as supposed to be her husband, and had a pretended marriage for the purpose of bringing about the purposes of God. The obvious question is why a woman would be eternally sealed to Joseph Smith instead of her legal husband. Several of the men were not active Latter-day Saints, so the women could not be sealed to them. For church members, Lucy Walker recalled Joseph's teaching. A woman would have her choice. This was a privilege that could not be denied her. The relationship between Edward Sayers, a non-Mormon, and his civil wife Ruth Vos Sayers and the prophet is a good example. Edward became friends with Joseph when he hid at their home from Missouri Lawman in 1842. Historian Andrew Jensen recorded, While there, the strongest affection sprang up between the prophet Joseph and Mr. Sayers. The latter, not attaching much importance to the theory of a future life, insisted that his wife Ruth should be sealed to the prophet for eternity, as he himself should only claim her in this life. How many of Joseph's other sealed wives sought him out is unknown, but those legally married to non-members are likely candidates. On page 31, the CES letter complains about Apostle Orson Hyde, who was sent on his mission to dedicate Israel when Joseph secretly married his wife, Mirinda Hyde. The chronology shows that Orson left for Palestine in April 1840. An entry on a single page in Joseph's journal in the handwriting of Thomas Bullock states, April 42, Mirinda Johnson to Joseph Smith. However, the author of the CES letter does not inform his readers that a second date was attested to by Mirinda herself. That is, May of 1843, months after Orson's return. Usually affidavits signed and notarized are considered reliable. Orson Hyde remained true to Joseph in the church throughout his remaining life. Of the 14 men, 10 were not on missions. Only Orson Hyde is documented as being on a mission. Three of the marriages are undated, so it is impossible to know in their cases. While it is impossible to prove something did not happen, is it reasonable to expect evidence of polyandry if it occurred secretly? Polygyny and polyandry are similar because they deal with plurality in marriage. Arguably, polyandry is more controversial. The CES letter argues that both were practiced in Nauvoo. What does the evidence support? These are individuals who left references to Nauvoo polygyny. Here are individuals who left references to Nauvoo polyandry. An important question is if Joseph Smith practiced polyandry, was it in accordance with his teachings or in contradiction to them? If Joseph Smith practiced polyandry in accordance with his teachings, then where are those teachings or even a single reference to any of them? Brigham Young taught in 1852 that polyandry is not known to the law. Five years later, Apostle Orson Pratt taught, God has strictly forbidden in his Bible plurality of husbands and proclaimed against it in his law. When Nauvoo polygamist Belinda Pratt wrote an article, Defense of Polygamy by a Lady of Utah, that was published in the church's Millennial Star, she was asked, why not a plurality of husbands as well as a plurality of wives? She responded, God has never commanded or sanctioned a plurality of husbands. Similarly, Bathsheba Smith, who became president of the Relief Society in Utah, was asked, would it be a violation of the laws of the church for one woman to have two husbands living at the same time? She answered, I think it would. Clearly, there are no known teachings from Nauvoo from any leader or member suggesting that polyandry could ever have been an acceptable practice. If Joseph Smith practiced polyandry in contradiction to his teachings, it seems that antagonists and even believers might have accused him of transgression or hypocrisy. 
Several Nauvooans accused Joseph and the Latter-day Saints of polygyny or a plurality of wives. No records of accusations of polyandry in Nauvoo have been found. The chronology of polyandry statements shows that the first report was in 1842 by John C. Bennett, but the first accusations were not voiced by antagonists until eight years later in 1850. All statements, at all times, from church leaders and members, condemn polyandry. The later claims of polyandry were not made by Nauvoo polygamists or polygamy insiders who remembered polyandry. They were accusations from distant observers, most of whom were anti-Mormons. Many of the statements are ambiguous. If we compare the evidences supporting polygyny to those supporting polyandry, what do we find? Supporting polygyny are plain supportive teachings, a written revelation, women recalling the practice, complaints from participants that it was difficult, defenses of the practice, officiators recalling the marriages, unambiguous references, and anti-Mormon accusations in Nauvoo. None of these exist for polyandry. The sequence of Joseph's plural ceilings is curious if polyandry was included. After Joseph Smith's first plural ceiling in Nauvoo to the previously unmarried Louisa Beeman, Joseph preferentially sought ceilings to legally married women. Then, in 1842, his approach changed and he was thereafter sealed almost exclusively to women who were unmarried. It seems that introducing Old Testament polygyny would have been easier than polyandry, which is condemned in the Bible, see Romans 7, 2 and 3. But if the sealings were non-sexual for eternity only, then starting with those makes sense. The author of the CES letter asserts that Joseph practiced genuine polyandry. However, Joseph Smith did not explicate or defend it. No polyandrous wives personally reported it, defended it, or complained. No polyandrous husbands reported it, defended it, or complained. None of the officiators or witnesses reported it, defended it, or complained. Anti-Mormons did not complain until 1850, nine years after it reportedly began. The appearance of two marriage ceremonies is not evidence of polyandry, and it does not justify the assumption that thereafter the woman had two husbands. For more information regarding Joseph Smith and plural marriage, visit josephsmithspolygamy.org.